Good morning. It's nice to see everyone here for Forum. Um, my name is Barbara Bynum, and I'm one of the folks who coordinate Wednesday Morning Forum, and my other uh, co-leaders are Phoebe Benzinger, Kathy Kievers, and Judy Ann Files. And if you are not on our email list, although I see mostly regulars, but if you don't get an email from us Saturday at 6 a.m., then you either it's going to your junk folder or you're not signed up, and we can um, help you get signed up if you want to get an email every week about the upcoming program. Um, this morning, we are joined with, by Lyndall Young with the Western Colorado <coughs> Area Health Education Center, AHEC. Um, and when we were talking about AHEC and all the programs they do, I was like, oh my gosh, 30 years ago, my husband was involved in AHEC when he was a medical first year medical student. He was like a summer counselor to an area group of high school students who wanted to learn more about the health sciences um, jobs. And so he took them around and, and gave them tours of the University of Colorado Health Science Center and all the different kinds of things. So he was like their camp counselor, um, and that was 30 years ago. And so AHAC does a variety of programs. So they do things like that. They do a whole bunch of other things. And they do um, opioid training, um, safety training. And this program was recommended to me for forum um, because we always say we're looking for ideas. DMEA had um, Lyndall come and talk to their employees and they said that she was really informative, it was interesting, and they learned a lot and it would make a great forum talk. So that's why she's here. Lyndall is a nurse, instructor, and outreach coordinator for AHEC and the facilitator of the Mesa County Opioid Response Group. And she's taught over 100 Narcan trainings across Western Slope and is a distributor of Narcan and Coloxo Bill. She is a presenter for Rise Above Colorado and has taught not prescribed in high schools and middle schools across Colorado. She's a Western Slope native and loves spending time outside with her family. And when she and I saw each other, we talked on the phone a lot, we saw each other this morning, and we were I know you, how do I know you? Well, our boys swam together on the high school swim team. <laughs> and so um, she's from Delta, but Delta doesn't have a, a high school swim team for boys. So five, five years ago, um, she and her son were coming down to Montrose to swim. And so we know each other as swim moms. So it's kind of fun to welcome Lyndall to our community this morning. So let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So yeah, my name is Lyndall. I'm a nurse and instructor for Western Colorado AHEC. And just like Barbara said, we do everything from CNA classes, CPR, QMAP classes. We find housing for medical students. Um, we do safety fairs. Um, and the other thing we do is opioid outreach and education. So um, just a little bit about the meetings. So we meet, uh, Mesa County Opioid Response Group meets three times a month over Zoom. We have a provider of treatment group, a prevention education, a recovery group, which is like sobers, living facilities, peer counselors, that sort of thing. Um, Delta Montrose Opioid Response Group meets one time a month over Zoom. Um, we've been meeting for over a year now. It's a great group. These groups are open to everyone. Um, we meet over Zoom, like I said, so it's pretty painless. Um, and then a couple times a year, we meet in person, have a lunch meeting, and have presenters that way. So during these meetings, we plan events. So we'll have standalone events, like on International Overdose Awareness Day, or um, we do events like at the colleges and different things like that. We have community outreach. So it might just look like a table at a farmer's market that has all our members' um, information, so resources to hand out to people. So really meeting people where they are. Then we do school outreach. So some of these pictures you'll see, we do opioid awareness weeks in schools, um, different outreach and education tables for the students and teachers and different things like that. And then we do like what you guys are gonna see today. So this is our community opioid response training. We do it everywhere. It's all free. Um, it goes from CMU nursing students to jail staff, to mops, to churches, to counseling places, to wherever, to you guys, right? So why are we doing this? So last year, over 108,000 Americans died of drug overdose. That's more than car crashes and gun violence combined. It's actually the number one killer, ages 18 to 45 right now, as well as the number one pregnant, uh, killer of pregnant women. So in 
1999, opioids played just a small percentage of the overall drug death rate, and through the years it has increased. We actually um, have known, right, everyone has heard of prescription opioids, right, and laws about prescribing and everything. So overdose from prescription opioids is this blue line that you see here. But around 2014-2015, illicit fentanyl came on the scene, and this is the red line. You can see what it did to our overdose death rate. So you can still get a prescription for fentanyl. You break your hip, you break your femur, sometimes an end of life care. If you take your dog to the vet, they might come home with fentanyl. Um, so it is still used, but the fentanyl that we're talking about here is completely illegal. So it actually comes in bulk ingredients from China, a little bit from India, but majority from China, into Mexico. It's made into press pills and powders, and it is flooding across our borders and being sold here illegally. So we had 10 times as many overdoses in 2020 as we did in 2016. Numbers continued to rise during COVID. A lot of our numbers, right, increased. But this was mainly fueled by that synthetic fentanyl. So here's just a little snapshot of some Colorado numbers. So we did see a tiny bit of a decrease from 2021 to 2022. But you can see here the percentage of fentanyl on board did increase. And our numbers that are coming in for 2023 actually are higher. This is a little snapshot of our state to show um, some overdose death rates. So um, in 2022, Mesa County had 44 death rates, deaths, Montrose had 17. Um, and so we can go into more data if you guys would like as well. Something we do see, whoops. Ooh. Something we do see in Mesa County um, and uh, all over the Western Slope is meth is still an issue as well. Uh, as well. So a lot of the talk screens that come back actually have meth and fentanyl. Um, they take it at the same time. It kind of creates a new speedball effect. So our meth uh, deaths are still on the rise as well. So let's talk about lethal doses a little bit. So this is how much heroin <laughs> someone would have to ingest to have an overdose if they've never done heroin before. With fentanyl, they say if you have a dry finger and you stick it into a sugar bowl, you'll have one or two little like granules stuck just with your natural skin moisture, that that's enough illicit fentanyl to make you pass away if you don't have a tolerance built up to it. So we are technically in that third wave of that crisis, right? We talked about prescription opioids a little bit. We had issues with that. Prescribing laws kind of came in effect right as heroin. Uh, was increasing as well, and so we had the heroin epidemic. Now we're into fentanyl. Fentanyl is definitely the drug of choice on the street right now. Um, heroin is actually really decreased. We had a little bump of it a few months ago, but um, by far it's fentanyl. So it's about 50 to 80 times stronger um, than morphine, about 50 times stronger than heroin, and it's cheap. So right now on the street, it's about three to five dollars a pill. In Phoenix, it's 37 cents a pill. So, um, and uh, it's easy to get. Um, they keep adding different things to it and changing it. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. Xylazine, you might've heard um, in the news. Pyro, we have found pyro in Mesa County, which is even stronger, which it's hard to wrap your mind around, right? When we know just the tip of that pencil has enough to cause an overdose. So let's talk about xylazine a little bit. There's a lot on this this slide, so don't let it <laughs> freak you out. So xylazine is a large animal tranquilizer that they're adding to fentanyl to change the high. So heroin is kind of a longer, heavier high, and fentanyl is a very short, light high. So to try to mimic that a little bit, they have started to add a large animal tranquilizer that puts them out for that longer, heavier time. Um, and it causes really bad sores, so necrosis sores. Um, we're not seeing it as much on the Western Slope as everywhere else. So out of all the fentanyl the DEA got in 2022, 23% of it had xylazine. In Philadelphia, 91% had it. So um, we have had three positive talk screens in Glenwood for xylazine. Um, after speaking to the Colorado Health Network, that's the syringe exchange program in Grand Junction, they feel like it's in Grand Junction. They actually hand out um, like wound care packages now as well, um, but we haven't had any positive talk screens for it, but they say it's really not an if, it's when that's gonna come into our area. 
So most of the time, our fentanyl looks like this. They're called blues on the street, and they look exactly like the prescription oxy. So I could actually have a prescription oxy and a blue in my hand right now, and I couldn't tell them apart even though I've seen both of them. They look exactly the same. They can look like prescription Adderall, Xanax. We have some on the Western Slope that's like an oblong white pill. It kind of looks like a generic Tylenol. So the powders have no taste and no smell, and they're being added to the majority of our street drugs right now. So cocaine, meth, um, marijuana not bought at dispensaries. Uh, a big thing that we have started to see is um, dab pins. So dab pin is like a vape that they smoke THC oil out of. So our last few overdose uh, talk screens from our youth in Mesa County have been from a dab pin. So we actually had a principal from the Career Center come talk to um, our biannual meeting in Grand Junction last month. And um, he said that a kid took two hits off of a dab pin on his way from Central High School to the Career Center for class. By the time he got to the Career Center, there was obviously something happening, went into the bathroom, the principal actually had to go in there and use Narcan on him and call 911. And the mother came back and said it had he had tested positive for fentanyl. So really trying to get the word out to our youth, right? That no matter if you buy anything illegally off the street, it doesn't matter what it is, it has the chance of having fentanyl in it, okay? So this is rainbow fentanyl. It's called Skittles on the street. Um, so how are they making these? So they actually take Tylenol, mix it with fentanyl into this pill press, and it comes out the pills. Now they can do this at an unreal quick rate, right? They can get a lot of pills out in a short amount of time, but it makes that potency is all over the place. So the DA says right now, if you have 10 pills, four of those pills could have a lethal dose where two of them wouldn't have anything in it. They actually use a chocolate chip cookie analogy with it. So if I had a chocolate chip cookie and I broke you off a piece and handed it to you, you might have a chocolate chip in it, you might not. That's the same with fentanyl. So even our active users don't know how much they are getting of the drug when they are using. So in 2022, the DEA seized 50.6 million pills and over 10,000 pounds of powder. The Western Colorado Drug Task Force in 2021 got 8,630 pills and 2.3 ounces of powder. In 2022, they got 159,242 pills and over 292 ounces of powder. So you can see the massive increase that we have seen. And I was actually just talking to one of our import members um, that works for the uh, Drug Task Force, and they said the 2023 numbers are even gonna be higher. If you've seen some of the news that of the bus they've done of people coming into Grand Junction, um, this fall that these numbers are even going to be higher and that's enough actually to kill everyone in the United States to give everyone a lethal dose if they would ingest it. So the crazy part about this is that we all carry drug dealers around in our pockets because the majority of this stuff can be bought off of Snapchat and Instagram so social media. Um, they uh, are actually bought with emojis so you can go to one pill can kill and um, that's the DEA website, and look at emoji codes, and you can you can see all the different emojis. So these um, can be direct message to people. You can buy it there. You don't even have to leave your house. They can be delivered to their house. I work with a gentleman whose daughter thought she bought an OxyContin off of Snapchat, had it delivered to her house. She took half the pill, and it killed her instantly. There was enough in that little tiny pill to kill five people and she thought she was taking an oxy. So, um, keeping safe. Well, let's talk about keeping safe a little bit. So we don't want to touch anything barehanded. So pills, foils, you know, stuff that looks suspicious. As we know fentanyl right now, it's not transdermal. That means it's not going to go through my skin. So if there was a pill right here, I could pick it up and I'm not going to die of an overdose, right? That being said, it's just a good idea not to touch any pills barehanded, right? Um, to protect yourself, they're always changing it and adding things to it and morphing, so we just want to keep safe that way. Um, you know, opening baggies, anything like that, we don't want to breathe any of it in. All of these contact ties would be really, really hard, but um, it's good to move forward keeping ourselves as safe as possible, right? So when someone is smoking fentanyl, it smells like um, burning popcorn or the smell of burning rubber. 
Um, once again, hard to get a uh, reaction from being exposed to smoke, but I've actually talked to two people in Mesa County that have had issues with that. One was a Parks and Rec um, employee who went in to clean a bathroom in a park in Mesa County and had someone with smoking fentanyl in there. He was exposed. He actually went to the emergency room but didn't have any bad symptoms to it. The other woman actually was a secretary in one of our medication assisted treatment programs um, and went and someone said someone was smoking in a bathroom. After looking at the tape, they found she had actually been in there for about 45 minutes, so concentration was very high. She was exposed and actually ended up getting Narcan and being sent to the hospital. So that being said, if we do feel like there is a chance someone is smoking in there, we definitely want to call 911 and get law enforcement there. As we know, it's so deadly that this person could need help, so it's good to, to take steps to help them as well, just keeping yourself safe in the process. So what is an opioid? We know, right? We know it's a pain pill, right? That goes from natural opioids, semi-synthetics, and then that fully synthetic. So think back to like poppy fields, right? Think of that they had to have such um, a big production, right, to bring it in. They had to have land, they had to have a crew, they had to have water and sunshine to bring it in, to plant it, right? So the, what we are dealing with now is that fully synthetic, so it's all chemicals, very easily accessed in Mexico um, and easily to, to produce. So we actually have these receptors in our brain that are kind of like a golf tee. And if someone takes an opioid, it comes in and it sits on top of that receptor and it does two main things in the body, okay? It's gonna block your pain receptor, right? And then it slows down your breathing. So we have more of these receptors in our brain than we need. So if someone takes too much of an opioid and it fills more of those receptors, your breathing's gonna slow down, you have lack of oxygen to your brain, other vital organs lose consciousness, go into a coma and then die of overdose. So effects of opioids, so usually that euphoria, right? Kind of that out of body experience. This can feel different for different people. So you might talk to someone and they say, oh, we went to the dentist and they gave me an opioid and it made me so sick and so nauseated. I hated the way it, it made me feel. And then you'll talk to other people that they're like, I got an opioid on, for the dentist and it made me feel really good. I want one every single time, right? So really, it, it depends on the person. Um, definitely get some sedation, pain relief, sleepiness out of it. What we are actually seeing with our active users, though, is they're not even hardly using for this. They're using to get rid of their withdrawal symptoms um, from the opioid. So tolerance develops at a really, really fast rate with fentanyl. So people go from using one pill to four pills to 40 pills a day within just a few week period. Because they're only high for about 30 to, it can go to 90, but mainly 30 to 60 minutes. But as soon as 15 minutes after that high is over, they go into the really bad withdrawal symptoms. That's why we're seeing overdoses like beside the road and at gas stations because people can't even wait to get home before they use again. And that's why our numbers are so high with the amount they're using. So on average right now, our active users are using like 40 to 80 pills a day. We've had intakes at community corrections and at our methadone clinics where people say they're using up to like 100 pills a day. And part of that is potency, right? So they actually might even be taking some pills that don't are just like a Tylenol, right? They don't have any fentanyl in them. These withdrawal symptoms, so um, they can be like 100 times worse than the flu. So combative, right, disoriented, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. I talked to one girl that she said she felt like her heart was gonna explode in her chest. She really felt like if she didn't use again, she was gonna die from her withdrawal symptoms. And she used an overdose and wouldn't be here unless someone had used Narcan on her. Uh, but uh, of course, their chance of dying from using again is much higher than their withdrawal symptoms. So some risk factors in an opioid overdose. So a change in tolerance after a period of accident. So, um, fentanyl is very, very addictive, and um, people go through lots of um, recovery pro of the recovery process. They could maybe be in rehab or something. They're not using their tolerance is going to drop, and then if they try to use at that same rate, they're going to overdose. Right? Um, previous overdose, overdose is hard on their body. Right? So it could, they could have damaged their brain or other vital organs. Mixing drugs, especially alcohol and other prescription drugs. So your prescription drugs that are sedatives, 
right? So if they're on a sedative and their vital signs have dropped already, it's not gonna take as much fentanyl to get them in that dangerous level, right? Uh, using alone, because no one's there to call for help. Poor physical health. And then that variation strength and content of street drugs. So that's kind of twofold, right? So like we talked about, active users don't know how much they're getting, but we still have people going on thinking they're getting an Oxy or a Xanax or an Adderall, and what they actually get is a fentanyl press pill. Some symptoms of an opioid overdose, so pinpoint pupils and then everything to do with their respiratory rate, right? We said they're not getting enough oxygen, so they're gonna be pale. They might be breathing really um, loudly, maybe that death rattle, that kind of sound that kind of comes from within their chest. Their lips and nail beds could be turning purple or blue. They're not gonna be able to talk. They're gonna lose consciousness. Anytime you think anyone is overdosing for any reason, you wanna call 911, right? You're gonna shout at them, shake them, make sure their airway is clear. You can do rescue breaths, administer naloxone. If they don't come out of it in two to five minutes, you can give them another one and then put them in the recovery position, which we're gonna break these down just a little bit more. So rescue breathing is just like CPR rescue breathing, right? You tilt their head back, pinch their nose, seal your mouth to their mouth, give two big breaths every about five to seven seconds. If you do this, do you potentially expose yourself to whatever's going through their body? Yeah, you do, right? That's why we have hands-only CPR now for people that aren't comfortable with doing um, rescue breaths. So you can still call 911, give them Narcan, put them in the recovery position without doing rescue breaths. This is just another step. We do recommend if you're gonna do rescue breaths to have some sort of face shield, right? This is just, this is actually a little face shield that you can get on Amazon. Um, that's a little keychain. That people are getting it, they can like tape it right to their Narcan box. That way you don't have to make a decision if you're gonna do rescue breaths or not. Um, if someone has overdosed and they vomited, they have a potential of having fentanyl on their face, so you want to take that knowledge with you um, when you're making your decision that everyone has to make for their own on rescue breasts. Let's talk about naloxone a little bit though. Naloxone is a reversal medication. Um, it comes in liquid form that they give um, IM. It actually you can find still in some um, first aid kits a pre-filled syringe, but it's not like an EpiPen. You actually, it comes in two parts that you put together um, before you give it IM. But by um, far the most popular that uh, is out there is nasal sprays. So Narcan is four milligrams per spray. Coloxto is eight milligrams per spray. So naloxone actually has a greater connection to those receptors in the brain, and it lasts about 25 to 45 minutes, but it only works on opioids, okay? So it's only gonna work on an opioid overdose, but what we know about cocaine and meth and a lot of those street drugs now, they can have an opioid on board and not even know it, right? So it has a greater affinity to those receptors in the brain. So if you give someone naloxone or Narcan, right, it knocks the opioid off the receptor. It sits down and it just tells the person to breathe. So you can see here that the opioid doesn't leave the body. It stays there. So this person has the potential to overdose again when their Narcan dose is out, right? So it's given exactly like nasal decongestant. So these boxes have two single dose um, nose sprays that look like this in them in little foil containers. And so you would just put the tip in somebody's nose, right? And you squeeze and all the medication comes out just with that one squeeze. So don't prime it like you do your nose allergy nose spray, right? You're gonna lose your dose. So um, wait two to five minutes. Uh, if they don't start kind of coming out of it, you can get your other one and do it in the other nostril, just exactly the same way. Make sure you don't leave them alone and that you've called 911. So Coloxto, so it did come out um, so I did the training with the drug company like almost two years ago now um, in the spring and they said that um, they're finding that people need more and more Narcan to come out of their overdoses, which makes sense, right? We know they're taking more and more, it's getting stronger. But what they said is the data is kind of skewed because they don't know if people are really waiting the two to five minutes to give someone the second dose, right? So if you gave someone one dose of Narcan, and you're waiting there, and it's a life-saving situation, and you're holding another one in your hand, two to five minutes could seem like a really long time, right? So are they waiting and letting Narcan take effect, or does the person need more? 
we don't know, but uh, Calaxto is out there for places. Um, we do trainings. I did a training at Gateway Schools, um, and we took Calaxto, right? So just because maybe they're going to be further away from help, you do hear stories of people needing a lot of doses of this um, that they have gotten it multiple times, and it doesn't hurt a person to get it. So you could give them both, and it wouldn't hurt them any, okay? So the person who receives Narcan won't remember overdosing, and it is unclear how they're going to react. So we do know a couple things. So some, if someone is an active user and they're used to having their receptors full of Narcan, I mean of, of opioids, right? If you give them Narcan and it clears their receptors, they're going to go into their withdrawal symptoms. So do we remember like combative? disoriented, right? They're not gonna remember overdosing. They're gonna have a very strong need to use again. So we recommend giving it, taking a step back and observing the situation, right? So you're not down in the person's face when they're starting to come through since they can be um, combative about that. Um, if someone is a first time um, like user, like they maybe didn't even know they were taking an opioid and ingested it, you might just look um, like for some increased respiratory rate, okay? Now let's talk about that xylazine, trank, right? That large animal tranquilizer that we know now they're adding to fentanyl. It's gonna change the way your reversal looks because it's not an opioid. So when you give someone Narcan and they've had that large animal tranquilizer on board with the opioid, they're still gonna be under that tranquilizer. Okay, so you're giving them opioid to help those receptors fill, um, to hopefully increase their respiratory rate, get a little bit more oxygen moving, and then EMS comes and they will give them supportive majors, majors at the hospital until their train use um, wears off. There's actually not a reversal for that right now. There's one going through the FDA for that tranquilizer, but they don't have one right now. So that will make your reversal look a little bit different. It's pretty crazy though. Um, I had, um, actually there was an overdose at Fruita Monument High School parking lot a couple years ago, and they said that uh, it was unreal that that student was draped over his steering wheel. I mean, he was purple, they had no idea, they thought he was gone that uh, school resource officers came, gave him Narcan, and within 10 minutes, when you looked at him, you'd never even know he had an overdose. So that's the huge reaction that you can get um, for Nar from Narcan. So they might need another dose. They actually might come up out of their overdose, be with it for a little bit, and then overdose again. Um, it just depends on how much they have taken. You wanna make sure you put them in the recovery position. The recovery position is just rolling someone on their side. So when we think of a lot of famous people that have died of drug overdose, what did they die of? Yeah, exactly, right? Fixation. So they, they um, pass out, right, on their back. They vomit, because that's what our bodies like to do when they're in shock or overdose or anything like that. And it fills that airway. Well, we already know people with opioid overdoses are having trouble with their oxygen exchange. So we want to make sure and preserve that airway um, by rolling them on their side. So this is why successful reversals need ongoing medical observation. So NERC. Narcan or naloxone is in the system for a really short amount of time compared to all other opioids. So um, not only could they overdose again, if they are sent to the emergency room, hopefully they're going to get information um, about recovery, you know, places, about different things they can do. Uh, opioids are so addicting and it's so hard to get off of them, but we do have a lot of different um, avenues people can go down for recovery. Um, medication assisted treatment, like I mentioned, so not just methadone clinics anymore. Um, there's Suboxone, there's buprenorphine, there's lots of different medications that um, can help people uh, hopefully be successful in their recovery as well. So our window for bystander response, so this is greatly shortened. So when I used to do this a few years ago for heroin, we would say one to three hours from overdose to cardiac arrest. With fentanyl, it's five to 20 minutes. So our window has greatly shortened, so what do we do with that information, right? So education, so after this training, go tell people about it, right? Um, 
and being aware of our surroundings, especially like with our youth, getting it to them that, you know, if you're at a party and someone is passed out in the corner, check on that person, right? Are they breathing okay? Are their lips looking a little purple? And then taking those steps quickly to get them help. There is an app for it, right? Because there's an app for everything. So um, on Android or iPhone, this is a free app. It shows you where to find treatment, where to find naloxin, and then it actually walks you through a reversal, if you're interested in that. So can you carry naloxin? The answer is yes. So since 2017, everyone in Colorado is at a standing order at a pharmacy um, where you can go, say you want a prescription for naloxin, give them your insurance information, and then whatever your copay is, you would pay. April of last year, it actually became an over-the-counter medication. So um, we're starting to see it. It's taken a while for it to be, you know, be on the shelves, but uh, for $45.99 um, at a lot of our Walgreens and like CVS, that sort of things. I did hear that uh, somebody saw it at a Safeway as well. Um, you can just buy it off the shelf. So still a price point though for people, right? Um, so we are still, we actually have been accessing the Colorado Bulk Fund for about two and a half years. That means if I do a training, um, I can offer naloxone to whoever wants it. So if you would like a box, you can take it with you today. A couple things to um, know about it is it does have an uh, expiration date, but it doesn't lose its potency after it's expired. So I was actually just on a lunch and learn call with the Colorado Consortium, and they said they think it's like good for like 10 to 20 years after the expiration date. So we work with an organization that actually takes expired stuff and gets it into hands of people that'll use it more quickly. So 10 to 20 years might be stretching it a little bit. If you don't like to have expired medications, just shoot me an email. I'm more than happy to give you one that's not expired. Uh, and if you want to give me your expired one, I'll get it to those people that will use it a little quickly. But we know that it doesn't expire as much as it says. It is a little bit temperature controlled though, so it doesn't really like to freeze or boil. So I say cars in Colorado are not a great idea. Um, keep it where it's a little bit more temperature controlled. These are pretty small though. You can open your box, stick it in a purse or a backpack or something that you're gonna be taking in and out of the car. Um, so Narcan is completely safe for everyone. Infant, child, um, elderly, people that are pregnant. Um, I actually, we just had on one of our meetings, we had the Mesa County Search and Rescue dogs come, like their handlers come to our meeting. They carry Narcan for the dogs. So we had two dogs that look for human remains and one was a tracker. And they said how dangerous it is for them because they have to go through like homeless encampments and different things like that and looking. And so they carry um, Narcan and, and can give it to their dogs even if uh, need be. So what's really cool I think about it is someone could be having a medical emergency like a diabetic emergency or a heart attack and you can give them Narcan and it won't hurt them at all. Okay, I could give it to myself right now and it won't even give me a headache because I don't have I don't have any opioids on board, right? So it's not gonna do anything. The only side effect of it is dry nasal mucosa and that's the same as saline nose spray. So it really is safe to give in an emergency situation. Um, won't hurt the person if something else is going on, but if they have an opioid on board, it's gonna, could possibly save their lives. So studies have shown the fact that drug users can have access to Narcan will not postpone their entry into drug treatment. Um, Narcan is considered harm reduction. We use harm reduction things every day, um, and it really does give you the power to save lives. If you're interested in more harm reduction things, this is its own rabbit hole that um, you can go down about, there's fentanyl test strips, there's xylazine test strips where people are testing their fentanyl for that tranquilizer, um, syringe exchange programs, different things like that. So you can go to solving SUD, that's substance use disorder, together.org to find out more about all of that. We do have a Good Samaritan law in Colorado, so it is designed to encourage people to take steps to save lives. So, so kind of twofold with it too. So if I would go out on the street right here and someone was overdosing, I could give them Narcan and they can't turn around and sue me because of the Good Samaritan law. The other part with it is that if you're at like a party situation um, and someone overdoses, the Good Samaritan law protects the person overdosing as well as the people that are helping with that person, seek that person, get help for that person, okay? Um, once again, really trying to drive that home to our youth. We had a 16-year-old girl last year die uh, in Grand Junction. She overdosed at a party. Her friends were afraid to call 911. They took her home, put her in bed, and she was dead the next day. So we do have medications that can really 
bring um, a person out of that. So encouraging people to take those steps are important. If you have a warrant, right? If you have enough fentanyl on you that you're gonna distribute different things like that, it's not gonna protect you. But overall, Good Samaritan Law will protect the person overdosing as well as the people helping. Lots of resources um, and different things I'm happy to share. If you would like to be part of the opioid response group, so we would love to have more Montrose people. So we have, um, and it's everyone, right? So law enforcement, um, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, um, recovery groups, um, different things like that, sober living. So we have Oxford House and Advocates for Recovery. We have a great group of Montrose, but we are always looking for more um, involvement and uh, we're more than happy to do this training for any organization. It's all free and I bring Narcan. So if you you know have a place of employment or a club, um, we do it for Rotary and Altrusa and all of those types of clubs, um, please take my card afterwards, shoot me an email, I'm more than happy to set a date and um, come to your organization or club. And I think we have some time for questions. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Um, what kinds of things do we still want to know that maybe weren't answered? <coughs> So um, I think the general population, I, th I think there is a stigma against drug users. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, stigma leads to a lack of sympathy for the, uh, you know, the, the users and the fact that they died. You know, you, you know, a lot of people, you know, say, well, you know, so what? Um, but the, you have uh, secondary victims, which is the family, which sure. gets a lot more, a lot more sympathy. Um, can you address, uh, can you address that? I don't know if it's a problem or a fact or whatever. Sure, yeah, and I think, so, and even stigma around Narcan, right? I mean, when it first came out, people were like, even the first, like, few years I was kind of doing this training, people were like, well, we don't want that training because if we have Narcan, drug users are gonna come here, they're gonna use, use more dangerously, things like that. So I think talking about it and knowing that fentanyl doesn't just affect one group of people. It is young, old, CEOs, stay-at-home moms. I mean, it is all, and our houseless population, right? And um, hard to reach demographics, right? It affects everyone. So knowing that, I think helps too. Um, I've done this for years and my cousin's oldest son died. I was <coughs> at a funeral last Friday for him. He had been clean since 2017 and he had a projected withdrawal. So that means he had been clean for a really long time. Something happened, he relapsed, and he was 36, and I had watched him grow up, and he was in my wedding. So, I mean, this affects everyone, and I think that helps reduce stigma, right, um, about it, too. Uh, we do have lots of family support in our area, as far as the craft program, through Advocates for Recovery, different things like that, that are helping as far as with families um, to support them, because it is, I mean, it, with this addiction, it is so hard, right? Everybody has seen that line of brain function, right, in addiction. Have you guys seen that? So like if you have a line, so your brain, can I use this? Sure. Yeah. So if you have a line, right, and this is your normal brain. Maybe you can use it. Maybe. <laughs> this is your normal brain function, right? So if you use, and it's something especially like fentanyl that's so addicting, and that's why they're, you know, people have a struggle with like, why are they putting it in other things, right? Why would someone want to put it in a dab pen that a high schooler is going to get? It's because it is so addicting, just when you have that little bit, you will be a return customer. So if you do a line of cocaine every year on your birthday, if it has fentanyl and you're able to live through that first one, you're not going to wait till your birthday again to have it. You're going to want it like the next weekend and then maybe the next day after that. So you get high, right? And your brain function goes up and it feels really good. And then you go down into withdrawal symptoms, right? And you dip down here. And so your new brain function is like this. It never makes it quite back up. So you're like, oh, I feel horrible. I'm gonna use again, right? And this is a prolonged time. But so you, you use again, but you don't quite get as high. You don't feel quite as good, but you even feel worse. Right? And then your maybe new brain function is here, right? So it's there's this wicked, you know, thing where your brain function actually 
doesn't ever, you know, you don't ever feel quite as good. And that is with fentanyl, that's why we're seeing people have such struggle in their recovery, staying off of it, you know, trying to maybe knuckle, you know, white knuckle it, try to do it without medication, assisted treatment, all that, because it is so addicting. And so having support of the family, different supports in the community is huge. Does that answer your question? And maybe this is where we need a whole other topic that talks about the history, because the medical community, surgeons, um, for a while there, they needed, they were being told to make sure that their patients had no pain. Oh, for sure. Yeah, well, we live in that, right? We live in a society that if you have pain, there's a pill to fix it. And our doctors have done an amazing job. And an opioid is a, it is, my daughter's had a liver transplant. And so I have watched her from two months old have major surgeries. And opioids, I am so glad there's opioids, right? They do a job, and doctors have done an amazing job with the knowledge through the years that they have had with prescribing, and there's a job for that. And now, I mean, it is way past our prescribing. You can't blame doctors, you can't do anything. I mean, there is so much illegal fentanyl right now on the streets. I right. mean, it's- People don't wake happened. up one day and say, hey, I could try drugs. Right. They, they, get, they get ankle surgery, they get prescribed drugs, they're told to, you know, take the drugs because they're in a lot of pain. Yeah. And the next thing you know, they're still taking the drug. And then the doctor says, I don't think you need this anymore. And doesn't renew the prescription. But that person who didn't wake up and say, I'm gonna start using drugs is now addicted to that. So it, I think some of that sympathy, you know, I think we picture the drug user as having a multitude of other problems. They, they don't hold down a job and perhaps they're unhoused and, um, and, and and I think we're seeing more and more, I'll just say, you know, a stay-at-home mom who has ankle surgery, who next thing you know has a has a drug issue that she did never, you know, voluntarily so I'm gonna become addicted to pain sure. Okay, what kind of other questions? I mean, he did such a great job answering everything. <laughs> Jim can always be counted on for a question. Well, I, w I was a former paramedic, and I've, I've dealt with a lot of these, uh, a lot of these issues. But I'm, I'm looking at kind of like the marketing strategy for, um, you know, for the drug suppliers. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the illicit drug suppliers, and that that brain function thing. There really, uh, um, it, it shows a way in which you can get somebody hooked on drugs, and and dumb them down enough not to realize that they shouldn't be. Um, you know, taking the drug, so it's okay. Um, but the, you know, the question I have is, if it, it seems like a, uh, if you have 108,000 people die of drug overdoses a year, that uh, that really takes an impact on your uh, your marketing uh, base. So you don't have as many people to market. So the, what what you need to do is you need to bring more uh, clients or, or uh, patrons into your business. I think this is a good way of, of, of doing that. Is there is it is there a strategy to do that? Do you suppose? I mean, do they you know the DEA know about that or? So I did a training with a DEA agent out of New York who was really interested, and he said that um, he had never really understood the statement a war on drugs. That he had been in Texas during the cocaine movement and worked in mansions and just different, you know, I mean, different things. He had come to the Western Slope of Colorado during meth, right? And like, oh, well, that single white trailer, they're cooking meth down there, right? I mean, he never really felt like it was a war on drugs. He had been in Afghanistan. He said he felt like he knew what war was. He said now with the drug cartels and what fentanyl is doing, he understands that it is a war on drugs, that they are in massive forces, they have AK-47s, they're going after our youth in different things, they're in our communities, um, you know, issues on the border, I mean, different things. He really feels like that war on drugs is important. And so, however you wanna look at it as a marketing scheme or a war on drugs, but he said he feels that more than ever he has before working for the DEA. I have a question, is the Narcan in my car better than not having it? Because I'm not yeah. gonna carry it in my tiny little purse. Right, but that's I, a good question. But so, I'm willing to put it in my car. I right. know that's not great, but it's probably better So than we did have that, so we did some trainings for people that um, an employee said, all they're gonna have it is if it's in their car, right? I mean, they are out on trucks, you know, out in the boonies, they're not gonna have it anyway. And so uh, my counterpart actually at Mesa County Public Health um, reached out and they said that 
it's better than nothing and it's not going to cause harm if it's in your car but they can't guarantee potency right so we don't know if it'll work or work as well but if it's the only way you're going to have it then it's fine does that make sense yeah, yeah it's, it's better than nothing better than nothing the chances Hopefully better than nothing it, right? right pretty low so i'm willing to put one in my car right but i'm not clipping it on my purse yeah okay <laughs> that's yes Hi, this, this is maybe a question for Barbara too. I had a surgery a few years ago and I told everybody involved I do not want painkillers. And I got a three day prescription anyway, which I tore up. But is there becoming some responsibility in the medical community for writing the prescriptions in the first place and alternate ways of dealing with after surgery pain? Sure, this is the kind of thing my husband and I talk about <laughs> for fun. Um, <laughs> and you know, this is, was his explanation is, I mean, I've heard his end of the conversation. He calls all his patients the night that they had surgery that evening. And he says, let's say to someone like you, please go ahead and take a painkiller before you go to bed. Because if you wake up at 2 a.m. and you are in excruciating pain, you, you're, it's, it's hard to get, you want to get ahead of that pain, and I don't want to talk to you at 2 a.m. and tell you that's why I gave you a three-day prescription. If you want to take it the first night, and then you want to switch to alternating Tylenol and Advil, which you can take, you know, that's great. Um, but the doctor that performs surgery on you is, is responsible for all of your aftercare. And so he wants to make sure, she wants to make sure that you are in a good position when they send you home. Um, and what they don't want is you to call. So who's on call, they, they answer that phone in the middle of the night. And if, if Dr. Um, Smith is on call in the middle of the night, but Dr. Jones operated on you, Dr. Smith doesn't necessarily know everything about you at 2 a.m. when you're in a lot of pain. And so, yes, sending you home with three days makes a whole lot more sense than sending you home with three weeks, which I think they used to do because they didn't know how addicting opioids were, the whole industry. Um, and so it's, it's always balancing, it's balancing taking care of the patient, making sure they're in good hands, making sure they're not gonna wake up at 2 a.m. or go back to the ER because they're in so much pain and say, that, you know, I had no idea it was gonna be this bad. Yeah, but it seems like we need to be, and we have been, I think the medical community has done a huge amount of education. They know so much more now than they, they used to when the philosophy from the manufacturers was, hey, this, this is, these aren't addictive and you want your patients not to be in pain. And that's one of the things you're graded on is how little pain your patients have. So we've come a long way. Yeah, sure. I don't know. Yeah, and really that, was, that, was, that was good. And I think, um, if you're if you're like a recovering addict and you have surgery, I think there is the doctors do have tools now to you know help you and say, okay, I understand you're not going to have an opioid prescription, but let's talk about so we don't get in that that spot at 2 a.m. Um, and I think with different medications that are out there too, um, when they're not opioids, but there are some other things that they can do. Because so, it is, it's crazy. My husband actually broke his femur and hip skiing a few years ago, and he is like the least addictive personality person in the world. And um, he had, so he had all kinds of hardware put in his femur and hip. And um, for seven days, he had medication that was 24 hours. He only had to take one, and then he had breakthrough, you know. And I can remember him saying to me after when that seven days was getting close, he's like, I don't know what I'm gonna do when I don't have that medication. I mean, he was having real anxiety that when that ended, he was going to be in pain and he was going, you know, it's gonna be left hurting. And um, so I called the doctor and no, they wouldn't give me more of that. And, uh, but uh, it wasn't at 2 a.m. So I, uh, but uh, 
you know, but they gave him other things that was, you know, different than just that breakthrough medication. So I think there's a lot out there that they can give them to help with that. And of course, if they have had any issues or anything like that, that would be a conversation they could talk. And I don't know why you still got your, Kathy, they just thought you needed your three days. Right. <laughs> well, and I think I missed an important part of the story, which is when he calls them at eight o'clock at night, they say, I am doing great. I feel really good. I have this under control. And he's like, well, your block is still on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's the part of the story that, that wasn't obvious. Is, yeah. If, yeah, you should be, you should still be feeling good, but your block's going to wear off about 2 a.m. Yeah, and so they think, oh, I had surgery this morning. I'm feeling good. I probably don't need this. So anyway, what other kind of questions? How about drug disposal? I mean, after yes. this question, what's a good way to get rid of extra sure. drugs if you do fill a prescription and you don't need them? Yes. So this might be for you. I can get you the microphone back. But the uh, hospitals graded on uh, uh, their Medicare reimbursement by the uh, fact that patients don't return for the same thing. Does that have to do anything with, uh, you know, with like administering drugs or? I mean, do they take that in consideration? Yeah, I don't have. I don't have. I don't have an answer for that. But um, but I'll. I'll preface my question about drug disposal with, I just spent three days with my 80 year old parents, helping them clean out stuff. And they're really worried they're gonna need something. They, they have all these old prescriptions and all these, oh, I was prescribed that, but then my doctor changed it to this, but, but what if I need that again? And so I would imagine that's not unusual to have a whole lot of every drug you've ever been prescribed and filled because you don't want to waste it and it's still in a sealed box or it's perfectly good. So can you talk about why it would matter if an 80 year old person had a whole bunch of extra drugs in their house? Like, so what? Yeah, so, um, well, one, it, they probably aren't good anymore, right? My parents are the same way. They have a lot of those. Um, and it's not safe to put them down your um, toilet, right? We don't want to flush them. We don't want them into our water system. But they shouldn't keep them also because actually crime is high for people that want to steal all of that stuff. So even just having that in your trash, like if you throw it away and it's a bottle, um, people can go through trash, they can steal that. So it's best to talk to your pharmacy. There is d d drug disposal drops um, that you can just stick them in and um, that's safe way. Montrose, the ER, right? Montrose. You just can park right outside the ER. ER is a box a right box. there in Montrose. And a couple times a year, we have days where, you know, we'll have a table set up. Um, we do have to have law enforcement involved in that because you can't leave it, you know, a box of those things just unattended. But, um, and then I also have, and I don't think I have any, I might have one, it's all in my car, but I could bring some another time. I have like a, it's actually from Butera, the oil company, but it's a drug disposal little bag that it, you can put your pills in there and it deactivates them and then you can throw them away, so. I think it's amazing how those drugs can make their way into someone else's hands. It right. can be the maintenance facility, it can be the worker that comes in to drywall, checks yeah. your cabinets. Exactly. It could be your grandchild knows that they can sell them at college. Yep. My son wouldn't do that, but I'm just suggesting that. <laughs> but I'm just suggesting that you know, if, not safe. if yeah. you have a lot of extra drugs in your house and you think, well, yeah. they are a problem. And it's it's a little thing you can do to be part of the solution sure. is to take those to the ER and put them in the thing. Yep. What about charity? What about, you, I recycle. And I recycle my, my medication bottles. So I throw them in the recycle bin can, can somebody go in there and get that and they because the doctor's name's on it the prescription number the pharmacy is that it is that an issue and if they're empty i don't know for hipaa you could just tear your cover off i don't know <laughs> tear the label off if it concerns you i don't know where your recycling goes or if it's I use a Sharpie on mine. Yeah, I, just, I mean, I X out my labels before I throw them in recycling. It's easier than trying to rip the labels off. It's right. really hard to rip those off, but I just Sharpie. Yeah. 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 Stick them in a sink full of soapy water before you put them in your deal. Maybe you don't know. Thanks to uh, some of the folks from our police department that came out to Yeah, do you guys have any like real see, world. I can see like head shaking or nodding or snowing during it, so I'd love to hear if there's anything you guys. Uh, 
I thought I was told that you could deactivate these medications with vinegar. So after my husband died, I did his pills with vinegar. I actually have never heard that, and I would be worried. I'm glad you're okay, because I'd be worried if it like was a chemical reaction. <laughs> like a gas, I've never heard that. You know, they used to say so in our, I teach QMAP too, which is Qualified Medication Administrative Personnel, and we say like, you can put it in, uh, if you don't have anything else, you can put it like in kitty litter, and then, you know, or coffee grounds is something that people, you know, undo them and put them in there, but I haven't ever heard that, that's the first I've ever heard of vinegar, if anybody else has heard that, but I would just be worried that, like it would be baking soda, and there would be <laughs> steam that you could inhale. Just so easy to take them to the ER, 24/7, yeah. right outside by the vending machines. Okay. Hey, thank you so much. You came all the way from Delta. Let's give her a warm.